It is the first game of the 1988 World Series. In the locker room of the underdog Los Angeles Dodgers, one of the team's great champions, Kirk Gibson, sits alone. Because of his injury, the team doctor has advised him not to play. But in his own mind, Kirk Gibson sees himself coming out of the locker room, entering the lineup at the last minute, stepping up to the plate and hitting the ball out of the park, winning the game for the Dodgers, and igniting a new team spirit that would sweep them through the series to the world championship. Gibson would later say that he imagined all this so vividly it seemed real. And then, it was. And if you saw that game, you'll never forget the image of Kirk Gibson, quite obviously hurt, coming around the bases. You'll never forget the reactions of his teammates, the crowd, and the announcers. After setting foot on the moon, Neil Armstrong remarked, Ever since I was a little boy, I've dreamed of doing something historically important in aviation. Famous college basketball coach Johnny Wooden says, Unless a kid can clearly visualize the basketball going through the basket, there's no chance he can throw it in when he has to. Harvey McKay has been dubbed Mr. Make Things Happen by Fortune Magazine. He has built a hugely successful business, authored a best-selling business book, and is a great civic leader in the Minneapolis area. Harvey McKay advises, have a fantasy. He says, that's what I did when I was 13 and dreamed of owning a factory. I saw it in my mind's eye a thousand times, and of course, I finally did it. That's what I did when I owned a factory and dreamed of selling it to the largest and most prestigious account in town, and finally achieved it. In his book, Swim with the Sharks Without Being Eaten Alive, Mr. McKay writes, I came to realize that fantasizing, projecting yourself into successful situations, is one of the most powerful means there is to achieve goals. Welcome to your winning self-image. You are already well on your way to establishing a powerfully positive self-image that represents you at your best. And most important, one that you are consciously and deliberately creating, rather than one that has been created for you. The tool you've been using is, of course, your creative imagination. And Dr. Maltz asserts that there is no greater power. What you think, you feel. What you feel, you do. What you do, you have. the self-image is intact and secure, we have wholesome pride, self-confidence, the ability to express and be ourselves, to function at our best. When the self-image is threatened, we feel anxious and insecure. When it is an object of shame, we try to hide rather than to express ourselves. Creative expression is blocked. We're hostile. All our actions, feelings, behavior, even our abilities... We act like the sort of person we conceive ourselves to be. At the beginning of this course, we talk about going into the playhouse of your mind. There, you are to create the kind of images that will show yourself and the world around you in a positive light. In the playhouse of your mind, you are free to put anything you want on stage. You can write yourself as the hero or villain of a play whose plot will be the story of either success or failure. Our hope that you will put yourself in the role of success, the hero of your own life story. I hope that you are working already on creating a self-image that is real for you, based realistically on your abilities and your faults. You should be cultivating your self-image, nurturing it with experiences of success from the past, and tending it with the anticipation of accomplishing your goals of the present and the future. You can change, but you must be willing to work at change. So work hard in the powerful world of mental pictures, and you will improve yourself in the world of reality. You can now go forth and create a new and better world for yourself. As you start each day, you can look forward to a new adventure in living, but you will need to equip yourself with the right attitude to wring the most out of every moment. 
Now that you have almost completed the course in psychocybernetics, let's recapitulate some of the points that you should think about as you start each new day. These are your daily dozen attitudes. One, truth. Has your truth about yourself been false? Most people tend to downgrade their abilities, their human assets. They dwell on their failures and overlook their successes. Is your truth about yourself related to you? Or is it an alien concept, divorced from reality and destroying you from within? Learn to see the real truth. Learn to see yourself as you really are at your best moments. Two, imagination. Here is a wonderful tool, but most people fail to cultivate it. Neglected fields will not produce prolific crops. A neglected imagination will not lead you into the green pastures of an abundant life. Learn to use mental picturing to plot your way to a better future. Keep on imagining yourself functioning within the framework of success until your success pictures blot out your failure pictures. Make your imagination a friend to be treasured instead of a storehouse of fear. Three, relaxation. Life is short. The individual who wastes it worrying throws away this precious gift that God gives him. Practice forgiveness. For forgiveness soothes the feelings and brings peace of mind. Forgive because no one is perfect. When you hold a grudge against someone for years, you may be blaming him for an inconsiderate act that you, in your own imperfection, might have committed. Accept others with their human faults and relax with yourself, fallible as you are. Relax with your failures and aim for achievement of worthwhile goals. Forgive yourself. See yourself at your best. Keep up with yourself. Four, that winning feeling. This feeling can move mountains for you if you feel you are a good fellow who deserves success and happiness. The spirit with which you tackle projects, your feeling about the self that performs in the world of reality, almost predetermines the results of your efforts. Once it is part of your basic personality, this self-belief will pull you through crises and will revive you if catastrophe befalls you. As long as you keep stoking the fires of this feeling, you are rich. You feed your automatic success mechanism and it produces results for you. Five, good habits. Your habits, added up and consolidated, are you. If they are positively oriented, you are a person who gravitates toward success. If they are pernicious, you stalk failure. You can discard bad habits and develop good ones if you are willing to work hard at change. Remember, success is a habit. Confidence is a habit. Six, dedication to happiness. People dedicate their lives to different goals. Why don't you dedicate yours to happiness? Making yourself and others feel happy. Develop feelings, skills, relationships that will make you happy. You must feel that you have a right to be happy. Otherwise, consciously or unconsciously, you will put roadblocks in your way. Insist on giving yourself this right. It is your natural heritage. Don't take it away from yourself. But find your own unique prescription. Don't follow someone else's. Seven, unmask your true self. When you are driving a car 50 miles an hour down a highway... Do you wear a blindfold? Of course not. But you might be going through life wearing a mask to hide your true feelings. This is a blindfold because in hiding yourself from others, you hide from yourself. You blind yourself to your potential qualities as a person. Learn to see yourself with kind eyes. You will have no need for a mask. Eight, compassion. This is one of the qualities that separates human beings from beasts, or at least should. When you feel for others, deep in your heart, you are soaring to your most wonderful moments as a human being. Others may express their gratitude, but your real reward 
is the warm feeling you will experience toward others and toward yourself. Nine, accept your weaknesses. You may be strong, healthy, and successful, but there are no guarantees in life, and sometimes everything will go wrong for a while. Your strong self-image will befriend you, but as long as troubles mount, you will eventually feel tired and weak. Now the question is, do you accept your temporary weakness in a human way, or do you blame yourself for it, feeling that you are a total failure? This is a key question. If you cannot permit weakness in yourself, then you can never feel secure. Your strength is not real. You are only a fair weather friend to yourself. It is only when you accept both your weaknesses and your strength that you can reach your full stature. Ten, live through your mistakes. The man who makes no mistakes does not usually make anything. These are the words of Bishop W.C. McGee, and truer words I do not know. If you want happiness, you must overcome any perfectionist streak that decrees that you must never make mistakes. If Babe Ruth had condemned himself every time he struck out, he would have destroyed his confidence in his ability to hit home runs. Learn to laugh gently at yourself when you blunder. If striking out in the game of life doesn't bother you, then you can learn to hit home runs. Eleven, be yourself. It is only when you are yourself that your life has real meaning. Stop basing your personality on the smiles and frowns of other people. Give yourself your own smile of approval. Strengthen your self-image, and the possible criticism of others will bounce off you. Ignore people who try to bully you. You must understand that they seek to do this out of their own weakness. You are truly successful only when you live your life the way you wish. Twelve, never retire. Ancient civilizations devised means of measuring time. They're not new. And these statistical devices of years, months, days, weeks, hours, cannot tell us whether we are really old or young. If you fill your days with exciting activities, you remain young even if you are in your 80s. If everything bores you, you are old even if you are only 18. Never go into an artificial state of hibernation. That is unnecessary. It will only weaken your self-image. Don't hibernate. Cybernate. In the time we've spent so far with Dr. Maltz and a psycho-cybernetic system, we've worked mostly with images and feelings. But there is a third, equally powerful internal device that can help or hinder us in the development of a winning self-image and the achievement of our goals. This third factor is the voice within. If you have a family member or friend or co-worker who occasionally talks to himself or herself out loud, you've probably kidded and joked about it. But as you're also undoubtedly aware, we all continually talk to ourselves, although most of us do it silently. What you may not have known before is how powerful these inside-the-mind conversations can be. This inner voice represents the voices of parents, teachers, or other authority figures who influenced us in our youth or the voices of friends and associates we respect now. Some of these voices become part of our self-image. We believe them. We accept everything they say as valid, whether it's currently accurate or not. These inner voices can have great impact on our immediate behavior and our servo mechanism. Being aware of them allows us to control them instead of being controlled by them. One of the things we often say to people who talk out loud to themselves is, it's okay to talk to yourself. But if you start arguing with yourself, look out. Well, arguing with the inner voice may sometimes be a good idea, as Dr. Maltz illustrates with an incident that happened when he was living in New York, in a penthouse on the 18th floor of a medical building. A number of years ago, there was a blackout. It was an eerie feeling to suddenly find myself in darkness. I picked up the telephone to get in touch with the hospital below, but it didn't work. I pressed the elevator buttons, but the elevators weren't working. I tried to put on the radio and TV. They didn't work. After several hours, I remembered I had a tiny transistor radio, 
and finally learned that New York was in a blackout, that nine states of the eastern seaboard and the eastern part of Canada, that 30 million people in all were involved in this blackout. So I went to bed. About five in the morning, the big man inside of me said, Hey, Maltz, you better get up. What for, I asked. You have to catch a plane to San Francisco at nine o'clock in the morning. You have to talk to a church there this evening. I was about to get up when that little man inside of me said, Don't pay any attention to him. It's only a lecture. You can lecture a month or so later. Look, you have the greatest excuse in the world, 30 million people to back up this excuse. Go to bed. I pulled the sheet over my head and tried to sleep. About 7 a.m., the big man inside of me nudged me and spoke. Look, Maltz, aren't you the fellow that wrote the book Psycho-Cybernetics that tells you how to reach a goal? Physician, heal thyself. You have a commitment. Honor it. I felt annoyed. Got dressed, packed two grips, put on my overcoat and my sexy rexy hat, walked to the doorway, and as the door closed behind me, what was left of the candle in my hand fell to the floor, and there I was on the 18th floor in complete darkness. And I could hear that little man inside of me say, See, stupid, come back and get to bed. I was angry then. I hugged the banister as I counted the steps from the 18th to the 17th floor. From the 17th to the 16th floor. I almost tipped over my luggage. But sooner than soon, I was on the ground floor and walked into daylight. It was 8 o'clock, and I knew it would take an hour to get to the Kennedy Airport to catch my plane at 9. I hailed a taxi driver, a man about 35, and I became melodramatic. I'm a doctor. I have to catch a plane to San Francisco at 9 o'clock. Do you think you can make it? Of course, he replied. I ran into the lobby of the building to pick up my luggage, and he disappeared. I hailed another taxi driver. It was 8.15. I'm a doctor. I must catch a plane to San Francisco at 9. Can you make it? I'll try, he said. He moved in and out of traffic, and ten minutes before takeoff, I was in my seat in the plane, and that evening I spoke at the church to 500 people who expected me. What am I trying to say? Here was a blackout affecting 30 million people, a blackout beyond human control. But what about the blackout over 100 million people in America create for themselves every day because of some error, some blunder, some heartache or failure, they walk into the dark tunnels of their troubled mind, creating a blackout for themselves. They walk away from themselves and from reality. When with a little compassion for themselves, they can cut away the barbed wire of their concentration camp and walk out of the darkness, the blackout they create for themselves, into the dawn of a new creative day. <laughs> While writing this book, I took a break and happened onto a television play about a great power blackout. I believe it referred to the one that hit the East a few years ago. It was about a group of people stranded in an office building during blackout conditions and about their often negative attempts to adjust to it. This play brought to my mind the overwhelming impact of living with darkness without emotional illumination and without a sense of direction. For you must know where you're going. To think clearly, you must dissolve emotional blackout and focus your sense of direction. This is basic. Reflection is a key step in achieving direction and thus in clarifying your thinking. Make use of your spare time to relax and reflect, to line yourself up and put yourself in order where you are and where you're going and have the endurance to go there. This is time well spent. Ten years ago, a woman came in to visit Dr. Maltz. She was about 40 years old, attractively dressed, but with a worried look on her face. She had a problem. I feel worthless. Why? I don't know. I just feel useless. Are you married? Yes, two children, boys, nine and eleven. What does your husband do? He teaches history. And your father? He's dead. How about your mother? Oh, she's alive, all right, but to tell the truth, I can't stand her. Does she live with you? Thank heavens, no. She lives about a hundred miles away. Yet she still bothers you? Funny, isn't it? I resent her so much. Have you any brothers or sisters? Mm hmm. Three other sisters. And do they feel the same way about your mother? I don't know. 
No, no, I, I don't think so. Well, why do you feel that way? She's always dominated me. Just you? Not the other sisters? No, she always picked on me. That's strange. Why? I don't know. She was always criticizing me, you know, finding fault. For instance, my mother's an artist. She likes to paint. Well, I suppose I inherited that from her. I like to paint, too, but she's always humiliated me, told me I had no talent. I always felt worthless. And I guess I, I still resent her. I don't think I'll ever forgive her. Now, that's not very reasonable, is it? No, I suppose not, but I just can't help it. Yes, you can. How? Do you have to live in the past? It's not that easy to forget. But you have to. How? By living creatively in the present. Oh, that's easy to say. And easy to do. No one is stopping you, after all, only yourself. You're not the girl now who was criticized by her mother. You're a woman now. A mother in your own right with a family of your own. How about day-to-day -day goals with them? How about living for them, for your husband, for yourself, in the now? Your resentment of the past is smothering you in the present. But how do I start? You see that painting on the wall? I happen to know Salvador Dali, the famous Spanish artist. He gave me that painting. It's his idea of what psychocybernetics is. Look. In the middle of the painting is a world. The left half is in shadow from frustration. Here, a man's image has shrunken to the size of a small potato. He is walking away from the world, from his loved ones, toward the black angel of destruction. Below, there is a ship without sails in the rough seas of frustration, about to capsize, never being able to reach port. The other half of the world is in sunlight from confidence. There, a man's image is ten feet tall. There's a swallow flying towards the sun. Below, a ship with sails in calm waters is about to reach port. Get the message? I think so. Our astronauts fly 120 miles above the Earth. They travel 17,500 miles in one hour. Half the time they see the world in shadow, and half the time they see the world in sunlight. You too are an astronaut. You can take off to travel into the vast space of the world within your own mind. Now, half the time it's in shadow from frustration, and half the time in sunlight from confidence. But the whole world within you can be sunlight all the time. How? Remember these four points. None of them are easy unless you have the desire to make them easy. One, forgive others. Forgive your mother for your own peace of mind. Two, forgive yourself. You've been unkind to yourself. You've been seeing yourself with unkind eyes. Three, see yourself at your best. Think of yourself and picture yourself as you are when you like yourself. Stop seeing yourself as a failure. Four, most important of all, keep up with yourself, not with someone else. If you like painting, go ahead and paint. Don't try to imitate Dolly. Stop making comparisons when you paint. Paint because you want to do it, because you love to do it. What kind of feeling do you get when you really want to paint? Oh, a wonderful feeling. A feeling of freedom. Then for heaven's sake, be free within you. You'll be better as a person to yourself, to your husband, and to your children. If you don't like what you do, start all over again on another canvas. This will be a way to find yourself, to build an image of yourself that you can like and admire. Your faith and belief in yourself are the wings that will make you the best astronaut of all time. Wings that will make you soar to your destination of success and happiness. Will you try? Yes, I will. <laughs> as good as her word. Eight months later, she came back and visited Dr. Maltz. You look wonderful. What a smile. I feel wonderful. Look, here's a picture I painted. It's for you. What a sad and mournful clown. Mm, that was me. But look at me now. You look positively radiant. No external force, no collection of circumstances and events is as powerful as your own self-image, created and directed by your own creative imagination. A few years ago, I spent a day at the seashore, 
It was a sunny day with blue skies, and I was enjoying the beach, talking to friends, watching people leaping the waves. Nearby, a young married couple with a young baby were putting down a blanket. The mother put the baby down, and off the little one went, staggering on her uncertain little baby legs. Her face dead serious. She wobbled up to a family sitting in deck chairs and, to my surprise, picked up a child's chair and carried it over to her amused parents. She then turned around and, with startling accuracy, carried it back to where she picked it up. She then climbed up on it with difficulty, sat down regally, and, with serious calm, surveyed the world. I found myself laughing delightedly at her spontaneous individual purposefulness. She was herself, so unlike adults who spend their lives trying to do what they think people expect of them. As adults, we must respect personal property more than does this baby, but we also can learn from her a lesson in the art of cultivating our own personalities, which should spring fresh from our inner being. This completes side A. Please turn the tape over to hear an important summary of the attitudes and practices that ensure a winning self-image.